I think, um, you know, maybe in order to, uh, I'll just maybe start off in this way <clears throat> from a kind of personal stand, uh, perspective. You know, I, I, I grew up in a Christian uh, home, Christian family. And so, as you might imagine, from a young age, I was, uh, became at least familiar with some of the details of the Lord's crucifixion. Um, and, uh, you know, at a certain point in time, uh, I, w I would say that it's not like I was never impressed by it, but, uh, I, I think a lot of times, um, we can, uh, we can sometimes a little over spiritualize the Lord's crucifixion. Uh, the, you know, and there are a lot of aspects to it. There's the side of, and, and actually next week, we'll be touching a lot more on the spiritual side. Um, this week is focused, I would say, primarily on the physical and psychological side of, of what the Lord went through in, in the crucifixion. And actually, the third aspect of, of, the, of, the, of this series that we're doing on crucifixion will cover what the Lord accomplished. And I think a lot of the times we focus on what the Lord accomplished and we also, uh, you know, try to find spiritual application in a lot of these things. But there is a base um, and the base is what actually happened. What actually happened to, to our Lord. And, um, I have to say that for me, uh, getting into this uh, has been very uh, enlightening mm -hmm. and exposing. Uh, and I, I realize, you know, actually the way that the Lord is, when we uh, encounter him, when we meet him, we get exposed. That's just the kind of person he is. And we'll get, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more. There's a really, really good picture of this. Um, but I feel personally like I've been very exposed getting into, uh, getting into this myself. Um, and although I'm familiar with the details, and I think a lot of us are very familiar with the details and a lot of the facts related to his crucifixion, uh, I think our hope is that today we would come to this as if we'd never heard it before and just come open like simple little children and uh, be open to what the Lord might want to show us. You know, in, in Galatians chapter three, the very first verse, uh, Paul says to the Galatians that Christ was openly portrayed to them as one who was crucified. So Paul, even in his speaking to the Galatians, he didn't uh, shy away from this in any way. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, he says that he determined not to know any, anything except Jesus Christ among them and this one crucified. And he even goes further in Galatians six fourteen, he makes this statement, far be it from me to boast except in the cross. Uh, actually, I'm just going to quote the verse. I'm going to uh, pull it up real fast. Galatians six fourteen. but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for Paul, uh, his boast was in the cross. And so when we say, what is our, we sh you know, it's worth asking the question, what do we boast in? What do we glory in? What is, uh, what is our boast? If, if we passed away, if we went to be with the Lord tomorrow, what would we want to be on our tombstone? Would it be the cross. Would our boast be the cross? Anyway, it's something to consider. Uh, <clears throat> it may be, as you consider, you know, and, and the younger we are, 
uh, maybe the less we may have to boast in because we may have not accomplished as, as much as those who are older. But in any case, what is, what is it that we glory in for Paul? And Paul was a very accomplished person. His boast was in the cross. And so uh, I think our hope is that by the end of this session, we will, uh, we will have a lot more appreciation for, and see the cross perhaps a little bit more in the way that Paul did. So um, before we get into that, uh, we just wanted to emphasize a few things uh, related to the Lord in his humanity. And uh, this has been very enlightening for me because I think a lot of times when we, come, when we consider the Lord and what he went through on the cross, um, you know, for me, I, I realize that uh, because I know that he's God, I kind of give him a little bit of a pass. Uh, in other words, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, I know, I know he's, I know he's a man, but he's God. So, you know, it just wasn't as bad, you know, as, as, as it seems like, um, it, it was, uh, it was bad, but he's God. So he had an extra kind of reserve of strength to make it through. Um, anyway, I hope we can put that thought to rest. Um, it's not, at, he was, he is God, no question, but he's also a genuine, genuine man. I mean, he actually spent nine months <laughs> in a womb, you know, the God of the universe, the infinite God actually entered into a finite man. And, uh, he spent nine months in a womb. And then he was born, and he was born in a manger in Bethlehem, okay? Not in the hotel, but in a manger, okay? So the manger uh, is not a pleasant place. I don't know if you've considered, but that place smells. It's not a great place to be born in. And then all of a sudden, you can imagine how Mary and Joseph must have felt these wise men come in from the east bearing these gifts and they were like, okay, wow, this kid is something. And then suddenly the shepherds come in and, you know, wow, we just saw these angels, you know. Okay, so they're realizing there's, okay, obviously there's something to this kid. But then after that, an angel appears to Joseph and they realize they have to flee. So they flee into Egypt and... As they flee into Egypt, Herod discovers that he's been deceived. And so he orders all the young boys under two to be killed in that region. Okay? That is the atmosphere in which the Lord came into the world. It's not a pleasant one. And it's, you know, it's not like he was spirited away into Egypt. They actually had to go there. And somehow they had to survive there until eventually Herod died and then they came back and he grew up in Nazareth. And, um, you know, Nazareth was really a despised place. Okay, think of a region in your country where if people hear about it, they're just like, Ugh. okay, maybe, maybe that's where you live. I mean, I grew up in places Sometimes where, you know, I would tell other people that's where I lived and they'd be like, oh, oh, okay. Let's, let's, uh, hmm. um, it wasn't like, uh, Nazareth, but anyway, there, there, the point is it was a despised region, even to the point that when Philip in John one went to Nathaniel and said, Hey, we found him, the Messiah. And then Nathaniel's response is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It just had that reputation. It was not a great place to grow up in. But that's where he grew up in this despised region. And he grew up in this family. He learned how to be a carpenter. Uh, and, you know, I, I really appreciate these verses. And maybe, um, let's see, uh, Gerard. Where's Gerard? 
There he is. Okay. Um, can can we read, um, Trevor? Can we pull up the iPad? I just want to uh, read two verses in Isaiah fifty three. So we're going to do Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> Amen. Okay. Can you read those for us, Gerard? Yes. As soon as, yeah, as soon as we can. Thanks. <laughs> okay. 2 and 3, right? Yeah. Okay. For he grew up like a tender plant before him and like a root out of dry ground he has not he has no attracting form nor majesty that he that we should look upon him mm. nor beautiful appearance that we should desire him he was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and ac acquainted acquainted yeah acquainted Mm -hmm. with grief and like one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we did not esteem him mm. yeah very good thank you so just notice i mean he he grew up like a tender plant like a root out of dry ground with no attracting form nor majesty that we should look upon him this was his background he had no beautiful appearance that we should desi desire him. And in fact, he was despised and forsaken of men. So this was God, but very much a man and growing up in very humble circumstances. Um, I just want to make one other point really quick before we move on. And that is, um, it, it's just, I think, worth noting he was in very good physical condition. It might seem a bit strange why we would say that, but, but just so we're clear, he was in very good physical condition. Um, uh, he grew up, he learned how to be a carpenter. Uh, over the course of his ministry, they were walking all over the place. Uh, Trevor will bring out some other things, but he was not a weak person. Uh, he was hardened uh, physically. Uh, he was um, not attractive in any way outwardly. Um, but this was our, our Lord. Okay, we're going to now go on. So we just wanted to emphasize these, these aspects just to make the point that he was very, 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 very human, uh, in addition to being divine. Okay, and um, I would, now we're going to fast forward, and we're just going to go all the way to uh, right before uh, he uh, actually is crucified. We're going to go to the house of Bethany, and... Um, and it, Bethany was a, was a place that the Lord actually visited a few times. And there were some people there that he knew very well and was very close to. Um, there was Simon the leper. There was Martha, Mary, Lazarus. And uh, anyway, he came to visit. And um, maybe we can go to, uh, let's go to, to Matthew. Uh, 26. And uh, just so you all are aware, we're going to mainly, Matthew 26 and 27 are going to be our primary text, although we'll be referring to the other Gospels. Um, and so just to uh, maybe make this clear, so um, Gerard, uh, let's, let's uh, go to verse 6, okay? Okay. And um, let's, uh, let's just read, let's see. Um, yeah, let's read verse 6. Let's just go. Read verse 6 through um, 16. Okay, amen. 
Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him, having an alabaster flask of ointment of great value, and she poured it out on his head as he reclined at table. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for much and given to the poor. But Jesus, knowing it, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a noble deed to me. Hmm. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. Hmm. For in pouring out this ointment on my body, she has done it for my burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be told as a memorial of her. Uh, yeah, and then uh, let's go on to uh, 14 through 16. Amen. At that time, one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me? And I will deliver him to you. And they weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, they sought opportunity to, look, to deliver him up. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very, at this stage, you see a number of reactions to the Lord. And, and actually, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't remove ourselves from this. Uh, because we have the same reactions to the Lord as the ones in this uh, account do. And, um, you know, Mary, uh, she saw the Lord. She heard him. She was sitting at his feet. And she realized that he was going uh, to, his, to his death. And so she prepared and then she anointed him for his burial. So that was Mary's reaction. Um, Simon the leper, he prepared his house to receive the Lord. Martha, she served the Lord. Lazarus, he testified concerning the Lord. So you see, the Lord is here in the center of all these people, and they all are having different reactions. And Judas... Judas has another reaction. Um, actually, based on Mark 10, or sorry, Mark 14, we see that um, the disciples, it even uses the word that they were infuriated with her. And later on in um, John chapter 12, verse 4, um, we see that actually it was Judas who said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Um, so uh, the, all, it, the disciples generally didn't have a positive reaction, but Judas in particular had a very, very negative reaction to what happened. Um, he was the one who held the purse. He held the money and uh it's in, it's, it, it indicates that after this, he goes to the chief priests and to the scribes, and he wants to betray the Lord. Um, this is actually something that's very applicable to us. Um, we may not betray the Lord to the cross, uh, but we have to consider uh, how often have we... Uh, be, have we um, not uh, gone along with the Lord? How often do we ignore him? How often do we uh, go against him in our daily life? Uh, we, we, you know, a lot of times we can read these verses and feel like this is talking about other people. But we should apply this to ourselves. And realize, yes, okay. I didn't betray the Lord to the cross. But uh, how often uh, have I had a negative reaction to something that the Lord has done or something that the Lord says? 
you know, maybe the Lord is touching me to do something, to speak, to, to uh, conduct myself towards my wife in a certain way. And I just have a reaction. No, I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I don't. Uh, it may not be to the same degree as Judas, but it's in the same principle. And I even actually in uh, Luke 22, verse 3, it says that around this time, this is when Satan, he, it actually says that Satan entered into Judas and he decided to betray the Lord. Uh, so this is the same as the principle with Peter. You know, Peter in, in uh, Matthew 16, he of his own, you know, he decides he wants to try to keep the Lord from the cross and the Lord refers to him directly as Satan. So in our own experience, we have to realize uh, that we are not exempt from this kind of experience. Whenever we meet the Lord, we are tested and we are exposed. Where are we? Where are we in relation to the Lord? Are we merry? Are we sitting at the Lord's feet and taking the opportunity to pour out what we have on him? Are we Martha serving the Lord? Are we Lazarus testifying of the Lord? Are we Simon providing a way for the Lord and his disciples to be together? Or are we Judas responding negatively to what the Lord is doing at that time? So um, anyway, we just wanted to highlight this uh, little experience at the house of Bethany. Uh, and uh, this became a motivating factor for Judas to betray the Lord. And uh, the Lord knew that Judas was going to betray him, uh, being God. And so uh, this brings us to now the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which uh, Guillaume will get into. Yes. Uh, amen. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, okay, today is a... Um, Okay, it's always special. It, it's a special subject that we are getting into. Um, and, and we need to exercise ourselves uh, to be in the spirit, uh, to listen to the Lord speaking, and um, to have a turn heart uh, to him. And try to imagine, try to put yourself in the Lord's shoes for this whole session try to try to imagine how you felt uh we talked about his physical condition that was really good he was walking around all the time miles and miles kilometers after kilometers he was healthy he was strong um and try to think about how you felt in his soul because like nathaniel shared earlier he was a man Jesus is a man. Um, you know, you, we all are God, men. And Jesus was exactly the same as us. So right now, you know, do you feel like God? Or do you feel like a man? Even though he dwells in my spirit, the fullness of the Godhead in Christ, as the spirit dwells in my spirit, I feel like a man more than I feel like God. And the Lord was just the same. He was just a man with all of his weaknesses, doubts, anxieties, stress. He could feel exactly how we feel about everything. The big difference, and this will be um, explained later, is that he was without sin. So his conscience in his spirit was void of offense. He had a pure conscience. That means that his intuition was very keen. He was very, very sensitive. He had an amazing intuition. That's why he knew. He knew Judas would betray him. He knew Judas probably had on him uh, the money that he obtained by his betrayal. He also had fellowship. This is the third part of our spirit. He had fellowship with the Father all the time. He was doing the Father's work. He was speaking the Father's word. 
He was seeking the Father's glory. He had intimate fellowship. And many times in Matthew, he says, my Father. In Luke and Mark, he says, Abba, Father, when he speaks to him in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's so intimate with him. He's so aware of what's happening. And so we want to have this view many times when we read the Gospels and the New Testament and the Bible as a whole. We may, we may think of ourselves, how this applies to us. We may think of the characters that the Bible presents, especially many times we talk about our dear brother Peter, that represents us very well uh, a lot of the times. But we maybe don't often take the place of the Lord and see how you felt. Um, okay, so now we are in this wonderful home with this fragrance in the air. It's very sweet. It's very intimate. The Lord is with the one that are precious to him, close to his heart, the one who followed him. He chose them on the mountain. He prayed to the Father a whole night to know who the ones who would be following him for three and a half years would be. They are the closest ones to him. Okay. Uh, some of the ones around the table in Bethany are uh, cousins of his. Uh, I think James and John are the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Salome. Um, some others have been with him for, for years. And so it's a, it's a quiet atmosphere. It's a, it's a sweet atmosphere. Yet the Lord knows what's going to happen to him in just a few hours. And so, you know, I don't know if you have that experience. I think you do. Um, when there is something, something big about to happen in your human life, you have, I know you have an exam tomorrow. You have surgery tomorrow. You have something that you know it will not be easy to go through. And it's just around the corner. Now you are at rest. Now you're with the, your loved ones. But you know in your soul, the moment is coming. It's just, it's just near. It's just around the corner. So you're enjoying the time, yet it's just in your being. You're aware of what lies ahead. So you have to, you have to, we have to get that, that this is the condition in which the Lord was. Um, it's, it's so precious. Um, okay. Amen. Uh, so where do we, we stop at verse 16, right? Uh, most likely we did. Okay. So I will read verse 17 and, and, and a few verses after that. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. So the Lord, again, he knows. He's very aware of what will happen to him. I am keeping the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them. And they prepared the Passover. And when evening fell, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Okay, this, this is the most important meal that ever took place. This is, this is a, this, there's a, a, a shift in the universe, in the dispensation, in the way God will deal with man. It is, it is a tremendous moment. We, we, we were just about to close the old covenant, the Passover feast, the feast of unleavened bread, and he was, he's about to establish the Lord's table. He's about to establish the new covenant. And so every time in the Old Testament that there was a covenant between God and his people, and even among the people, they were having a feast. So this is, this is a big moment. And, you know, 
in the French culture, I'm from France, I'm from Paris, um, you know, eating is a big thing. Nothing, you cannot compare any kind of meal with this one. Yet, yet he is realizing one of you that are so close and dear to me, one will betray me. And so he's talking to them about his death on the cross, just a few verse prior, and, and they don't get it. They still don't get it. It's the fourth time he's talking to them about what will happen to him, and there's, they don't get it. They're still waiting for the Messiah, the anointed one to come and establish a physical kingdom right then. So if I'm, if I'm the Lord, and these are the ones who have been with me for over three and a half years for some, and they've seen me live, they've seen me interact with people, they've seen the love of God through me, they've seen all the miracles, They've, they've heard all of the teaching and still they don't get it. And I'm about to go away. I'm about to disappear. And they will be entrusted with carrying out this wonderful commission. And so would you feel confident that this will go well? Okay. So one will betray him. And now they are like, talking to one another, who will do this? Lord, is it I? Is it me? And then in Luke, in the account of Luke, so you have three different accounts, actually four with the Gospel of John in verse in chapter 13. But in Luke, it says there was a contention between the disciples. They were talking about who will be the greatest among us. So the Lord is talking about his death, and they are talking about Okay, will I be the one who betrayed the Lord? Or they're talking about who will be the greatest? If I was the Lord, I would be, I would not be very confident that things will be fine after my departure. Um, after that, it even, even gets worse uh, because he's talking about how the Lord is talking to them about how he was sending them to preach the gospel, that's earlier in the gospel of Luke, without sandals, without, without anything, trusting that the Father will provide for them, and he did. But he's saying now things have changed. The way people are receiving us is different. It's hostile. So now when you go out, you need to have a sword. I don't know if you rem remember that account in Luke 22. And so, and so they're saying, okay, here it is, Lord, we have two swords. He responds to that in verse 38, it is enough. Not that the swords are enough to protect them, but it's just that you, you are not getting it. And so in his soul, it must have been very hard to follow the father and looking at all the ones around him and trusting that this will be fine when this thing will be in their hand. Um, Okay, I want to, uh, Trevor, could you, could you pull up um, that picture of that painting, uh, please? So this is a painting from Rubens uh, from 1632. Um, if it's exposed in, um, in Milan. So here you have, you know, the scene anyways, forget about the physical appearance of the people there. Just, just forget about the whole thing. The only thing I want to bring out is the one who is looking at us is Judas. Okay. They're all looking at the Lord or they all have their you know, gaze in one direction. But the only one who is actually completely off the scene is looking at us is Judas. And so that shows as Nathaniel explained that, you know, we are all like Judas. We are all like him. And so it doesn't matter what price is ours to forsake the Lord, but we, we all act the same way. And so what is the price for us for not going to a meeting, uh, for us to not, um, you know, speak something of the Lord when the time comes, for us not to 
say anything when someone mocks the Lord? What, what is our price? And so we are all like Judas. And there's another famous painting that I, I'm sure most of you have seen. This is from Da Vinci. It's like this long table. The Lord is in the middle. On his right side, you have Judas and, and John. And on his left side, you have Peter. And Peter is like this. He's kind of a, in the back behind other disciples with like no expression on his face. And his finger, as always with Da Vinci, is like facing heaven. And Judas on the other side is a little bit leaning backward. And so that scene, even though you can criticize this all you want, uh, it, it just shows that this was the atmosphere in which the Lord was. One was betraying him. The other one was saying, and we come to that later, if, if they all forsake you, I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. I will always stand for you. I will even die. This is what he says. This is Peter. He says, I will die with you. And the Lord, he knows, okay? He knows what will happen. And so when you have a group of friends, a group of, of family members, and you want to share your heart to them, you want to explain to them why you want to go to this school, why you want to go to the full-time training, why you want to marry this person, why you want to do what you're about to do, and no one gets it. it it's, it's, not a, it's not a nice feeling. It's not an easy thing to go through. And this is what the Lord had to pass through in his soul. He was already suffering in his soul because of the one with him and the atmosphere uh, around him. Okay, now we can go back to the, the, to the text, to uh, Matthew 26. Okay, so one will betray me. Um, okay, uh, William. William, we share the same first name. Do you know that? William is uh, Guillaume in uh, French. If you are still uh, available and unmuted, perhaps you could read to us um, the next few verses, maybe verses 24 through 26. The Son of Man is going away, even as it is written concerning him. But woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It will be bad, it will be good. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Jesus who was betraying him answered and said, I I am I am not the one, am I rabbi? He said to him, You have said it yourself. And and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, "Take, eat. This is my body." Amen. Okay, verse twenty-seven. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, "Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many, amen, for the forgiveness of sins." But I said to you. I shall by no means drink of this product of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my father. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So again, this moment is, is a key moment in human history. Yet the ones with him are not clear about what's about to happen. And they don't, it doesn't appear that they are trustworthy. They are fragile, they're weak, they're proud, they're arrogant, they're betraying him for one. It's just, it's just not, I don't think the Lord was very confident. He was a human man, he had doubts. And so as we'll see in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord was already under a lot of pressure at that point. Okay, now they go, they take a walk. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's about two miles away, 3.2 kilometers away from Bethany. And so they're there. So you have to imagine, you have to imagine, you were together with the disciples, reclining at table, eating. 
it's a nice environment to be in despite the doubts despite knowing what will take place you are still with your closed ones it's the last moment you know it's the last moment that you're quiet you're still at rest to some extent even though again in the soul he was already under some some pressure um but you know humanly I don't know how to describe this, but I'm sure you, you all have had that experience. You, you are in a, in a safe environment and you know that once you leave that door, once you'll get into that car, once you'll, th things will be different, forever different. And so this was the last moment of rest to some extent. Now he's in the garden. So the nice odor of the fragrance is gone. The warmth of the upper room, it is gone. Now he's in the garden. It's probably cold. It's for sure dark. And he knows what will take place. And so I don't know if you can imagine what's going on in his mind at that point. Okay. Gethsemane means oil press. So it's it's exactly what happened he was pressed he was pressed to the uttermost so that the spirit within him could eventually be released and this is this is what he went through as a man in the garden of gethsemane in his soul okay verse 31 then jesus said to them you will all be stumbled because of me this night for it is written I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. Then Peter answered and said to him, if all will be stumbled because of you, I will never be stumbled. So this is what we talked about a little bit earlier. Peter is so confident. And actually, they all say the same. No, no, Lord, we will all be just like that. But Jesus said to him, he knows, he's just, he has the intuition and he's in fellowship with the father. He's not surprised with what's will, what will happen next. Truly, I said to you that in this night, because before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Three times, the ones that are close to you. He, 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 he shared meals with him. They, they slept in the same place. He was there with him in all the thing that he passed through. And this friend, this very close disciple of mine will betray me. You know, I'm, I'm a very, okay, I like to be alone at times. I really like it, but I, I'm, a, I'm a people person. I, I, I just, I just, I'm just a social person. And so I have, a, I have a very good number of very close friends. When I received the Lord, I lost them all, okay? My salvation was very dynamic and I realized a number of things. I was very filthy and, and the environment I was in was just not good. So I turned my back and I just, uh, by the Lord's mercy and grace, took a different path. It was hard to lose the friends. It was, it was a difficult thing. And some of my friends did things that are not nice. Um, so it, it doesn't compare at all with what the Lord went through. But you know that these ones that are so close to you are betraying you, will let you alone, will vanish in the air. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will by no means deny you. And all the disciples said likewise, all of them. And Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking Peter and the two sons of Zebedee aside, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Okay, so now, it's, it's, now the pressure is really on. He knows in, in, in about a few hours, I'll be arrested and I'll be crucified. So try to imagine what's passing through his mind. He's extremely sorrowful, he's disturbed. Even in John 13, I think it says like his spirit, let me quote that to you properly, he's troubled in his spirit because he has 
again, this very keen intuition is not, he, okay, he's a mature man. He knows what crucifixion is. He have probably seen it in his, in, during his lifetime. He, he knows what lies ahead. And yet he is willing at a great cost to take the father's will. And so this is what happens here. He goes to pray and he takes the one that seemingly are the closest to him, Peter, James, and John. And he tells them, pray, pray for me, stand with me, bear this burden with me. And so he tells them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And so the Lord is not exaggerating. The Lord is not a liar. He's saying that his soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And so maybe it's a death of a heartbreak because he's realizing these dear ones around me, okay, they, they are not getting it. They're fighting against each other. I'm about to die. I need to go to the Father, do the Father's will. He's extremely sorrowful, even unto death. This is a very intense moment that the Lord is passing through. In Luke, in the account in the Gospel of Luke, Luke the physician, he tells us that he was sweating blood as he was praying. We mentioned right. that in a previous dive session, but it's like it's a hemorrhage inside his body. And so there is blood that is going into the sweat glands sweat glands that is now mixed up with the perspiration and the, the skin becomes very fine and very tender. And as the Lord is sweating, now blood is coming out. That shows a tremendous amount of pressure. He's under emotional distress. He's under anguish. He's praying to the Father. He's really pressed. The oil is being pressed in him to accomplish the Father's will. Okay, now verse 39. Uh, maybe, uh, Lily, could you read uh, the next few verses for us, uh, please? And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came disciples and find them sleeping and he said to Peter so wait so were you not able to watch with me for one hour watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak again going uh, going away a second a second time he prayed saying my father if this cannot pass away unless I drink it your will be done and coming again then he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And, and leaving them, he went away again and prayed at the time, saying the same word again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour has drawn near, and the Son of Man is being delivered up into the hands of sinners. Okay, Around that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Amen. Thanks for reading these verses. Um, okay, so here the Lord, the God man, but he's really a man. He, he, he goes to pray and he has a different will. He, he knows what will happen to take by taking the Father's will. So he's praying. And he's praying three times the same words. So he's asking the Father, Father, if this is possible, if there is a plan B, I'd like for it to be a, a plan B, but not as my will, not my will, but as you will. And so Hebrews 5.8 tells us that even though he was a son, he learned obedience through sufferings. This is not an easy thing. Right. Like Nathaniel shared, he is a man. It is not an easy thing, and especially with the kind of intuition that he has and the fellowship that he has with the Father, he knows exactly what will happen. He's not surprised. He's not, 
is aware, is very, is aware of what, what lies ahead. And so he's asking the disciples, can you please stand with me? Can you pray? They, they, they fell asleep. And so, you know, today, today, there's so many things happening in the world. The Lord in his heavenly ministry as the high priest and the heavenly minister and the divine administrator is praying for the churches, for the saints, and for God's economy to be carried out. How much are we praying? How much are we standing with him in these things? You know, we are all on Zoom right now. We are all in some way, you know, on pause in some way. Can we take the time to stand with the Lord and to pray? Anyways, so the Lord is praying to the Father three times, asking if this cup could be removed from him, but he's willing to just to take it. And so you have to, again, put yourself in his shoes. What's ahead of him is it, it's not something easy. I mean, we'll get into details. Nathaniel and Trevor will get into the details of what the Lord passed through. But you have to see where the Lord is at this point with his disciples. Now, just a little side note. Um, I told you that some of the disciples were his cousins. Um, two of the ones who wrote epistles in the New Testament, James and Jude, were not disciples, were not following him. They were brothers in the flesh, you know, born of Joseph, so half brothers. They were not following him. Okay. But later, they wrote epistles. Even James became a pillar in the church in Jerusalem. So, you know, this is just, again, a side note, but these are the ones who saw the Lord, his living, his human living, and they did not believe him when he was alive. But he was crucified and he resurrected, praise the Lord. And after that, they believed. Mm -hmm. So they saw that he was perfect, mm -hmm. sinless, obedient to the Father, even unto death. And that made them believers, and they even wrote Holy Scripture. So that's, to me, it's, it's just a proof that this thing is, is powerful. What the Lord displayed, his living, his obedience was extremely powerful. Um, amen. Okay, sorry, I've been a little bit long. Um, this is setting the stage for what's uh, coming up. And uh, I will pass it on to um, Amen, Nathaniel. So, uh, you know, at this point, um, the the Lord is uh, going through uh, a very uh, heavy. There hasn't been too much physical suffering, although you could say, you know, he has been walking for a period of time, and uh, also. Uh, he's uh, starting to get kind of tired. I mean, you see the disciples are having trouble staying awake. Um, the Lord, because of the psychological uh, burden that is on him, uh, he's there and he's praying and dealing with the Father. Um, it, and, and really, in, in one of the other uh, accounts, in one of the other Gospels, it says that he was awestruck. And that implies a kind of shuddering horror came over him. Uh, and Guillaume alluded to the fact that he was, he had this condition known as hematidrosis where he was set sweating blood. So psychologically, he's under an incredible amount of pressure. And, you know, just remember, we're laying aside right now the fact that he is God. You know, if you read the Gospel of John, the account reads very differently. But right now we're focusing on him in his humanity. And so as he's there, now we have verse 47. And maybe we can have, um, actually, Lily, could you read for us again? Um, verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Mm. And um, 
Actually, why don't you go ahead and read all the way until verse 50. Okay. Now the one who was betraying him had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he came to Jesus and said, rejoice, Rabbi, and kissed him affectionately. But Jesus said to him, friend, why are you here for? What are you here for? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, of course, the Lord in his omniscience knew that Judas would betray him. But we should remember a few things. One is that before the Lord chose the 12 disciples, he spent the entire night in prayer to the Father. Uh, these disciples were not cho chosen lightly. Uh, not only so, but after he chose the disciples, now he has spent time with them. They've eaten together. They've slept in the same um, dwelling places together. They've passed through so much together. Um, and Judas, he was in charge of the finances. So he had to have had a substantial amount of contact with the Lord uh, over this period of time. The Lord, in his feeling towards Judas, he was not indifferent. Uh, Judas was one of his 12 disciples. So now Judas has made the decision to betray the Lord and he comes up to him and he says, rejoice, rabbi. And you know, Guillaume pointed this out and I think there's something to it where, you know, a lot of times when we go against the Lord, uh, you know, there's a little bit, we, 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 we kind of have to convince ourselves uh, that uh, we are, we're actually, you know, enjoying whatever it is that we're doing. And we have to kind of, uh, even though inwardly in the depths of our being, we know that uh, we're kind of, uh, we're, 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 we're going against the Lord. Uh, we have to kind of psych ourselves up a little bit. And, um, you know, Judas, as he comes, he tells the Lord, rejoice. And he knows, and the Lord knows. And then he kisses him. You know, it's just, uh, this sheds some light, perhaps, on, on Judas. But also, you know, how do you think the Lord must have felt uh, receiving that kiss? Um, and then he says, friend. What are you here for? Uh, and, and, and here, um, this is not uh, the only place, uh, of course, in Matthew, where it's described also in Mark and in Luke. In John, it's very interesting. John, of course, focuses on the fact that he is, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. And so in John uh, uh, 18, um, you know, the, they come. And uh, in verse, uh, let's see, it's, um, he, he comes for, actually, he comes forward to them. And he says, whom do you seek? And uh, he, they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And then uh, he says, I am. And then if you look in verse six, it says, when therefore he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So here we do see, yes, he is God, okay? Um, and he, allow, he, he did allow himself in the, as God to be taken. Uh, but we want to focus in this session more on the fact that he is a man. And as a man, uh, he, a, a number of things happen. Of course, you know, you have all the disciples there, and now they realize that Judas has betrayed the Lord. So they are going through a similar kind of experience that the Lord is. And after Judas uh, kisses the Lord, the, they try to uh, take, take the Lord. And uh, one of those who is with Jesus, you see this in verse 51, 
he stretches out his hand and he draws his sword to strike the slave of the high priest and he cuts off his ear. Um, and actually in Luke, uh, it talks about a bit earlier, you know, he, the Lord says something and the disciples say, oh, here, we have two swords. And then the Lord just says, it is enough. And it doesn't mean that's enough. We just need two swords. It means just stop. We're done here. Um, the Lord really put up with a lot with the disciples. Anyway, uh, Peter, he cuts off the ear of the slave of the, of, the, of the high priest. And that slave's name was Malchus. And Jesus, you know, you just consider. Uh, and he says this, uh, you, uh, you, can, you, have, you could have arrested me in the temple. You could have arrested me openly. But you come in the dark of night and you have, through one of my disciples who has betrayed me, now you're trying to take me. Uh, it's, it's really a low and uh, it's really kind of a despicable way of doing things. It's just very uh, insidious and sneaky. And, uh, but this is what is happening. And the disciples, especially Peter, is filled with a kind of righteous indignation, and he cuts off the slave's ear. The Lord's response is he takes the ear and he puts it back. He heals the slave. Uh, and then he says in uh, verse 53, or do you think that I cannot beseech my father? And he will provide me at once with more than 12 legions of angels. How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? And then, you know, as we said, he, uh, he tells them, have you, you know, uh, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to arrest me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has happened in order that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. And then I want to note this this one. And at the end of verse 56, it says, then all the disciples left him and fled. Okay. He had spent all night praying to the Father and selected them. They had been together. They had been a company together for the last three and a half years. Now, at the moment, at the moment, when he needs them the most and after they have all sworn that no matter what happens, they will stay with him. As soon as he seized, they all flee. So the betrayal here is not just from Judas, but he's also actually betrayed by the rest of the disciples. So you can imagine, start to imagine a little bit, as Guillaume was saying, we have to put ourselves in his shoes and understand the psychological toll that is being taken on him, where not only is he fully aware of the suffering that is coming, but he's learning through suffering. He's learning obedience. He's being perfected in all these experiences, and he's being betrayed by Judas, and now by the disciples. Okay. Uh, I think what we'll do now is we're going to talk a little bit about what happens uh, in, in the Gospels. The account of Peter denying the Lord is interwoven with what happens as he's being judged by the Jews and then the Romans. So I think we can just do it that way. But one characteristic, and maybe, um, let's see, Gerard, you can read this verse for us. Let's go back to Isaiah 53, and we'll read verse uh, 7. Uh, okay, sorry, here you go. Can you read verse 7 for us? Yep, I would. He was oppressed, and it was he who was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Mm. 
So uh, this is quite striking. He didn't open his mouth. Uh, and this was happening as he was being accused. And we'll look at the verses. But Gerard, I just have a question. Um, let's say I, I just made a statement that, uh, you know, Gerard, yesterday <clears throat> I saw you, I saw you steal from the store. Is there anything in you that kind of rises up right now? Well, most definitely, yeah. You're like you're not super happy with that statement, are you? I I am not. Um, yeah. You, do you want to say something to kind of counter that? Well, well, there's the emotions in me is rising up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say I would like to yeah. If, anyway, beat any would, person who says that, but yeah. but yeah. Something in me is also saying, don't do that. <laughs> Would you like to vindicate yourself? Yeah, of course. And you say, no, I, I, I didn't do that. No, absolutely not. Okay. For the record, I didn't see Gerard do it. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm certain he didn't. Uh, but the point is, we all have that reaction. Whenever someone says something about, especially if it's not true. Okay. It's one thing. I mean, a lot of times, even if it's true, we still try to defend ourselves. But especially if it's not true, we immediately have a, have a reaction. And the reaction is to vindicate and to say, no, 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 no. You don't know. That's not what happened because we have our own. Um, it's actually a reaction that's in ourself. And it, it's, we want to preserve our own uh, self. We want to preserve our honor. And, uh, okay, so now let's go back to Matthew. And uh, actually, we're going to go, um, we need to go to John. John 18. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because in the sequence, first, actually, Jesus is taken to Annas. Um, let's go to John 18, verses 13 and 14. Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Okay? And Caiaphas, he had advised the Jews in an earlier portion in John that it was expedient for one man to die for the people. Okay? So now, uh, he's there uh, with Annas. And let's go to verse 19. Okay? So while this is happening, Peter is outside. He's, Peter is following. And um, can you read that, uh, Gerard? Hi. The high priest then questioned Jesus concerning his disciples and concerning his teachings. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that's good. That's Annas. Now let's go back to Matthew 26. And let's go down to verse 60, I think. It's a little bit of a ways. Okay, sorry. Um, go up a little bit. I think. Uh, yes, verse 57. Okay. And those who seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Right. So after Annas, they then take him to Caiaphas. And it's interesting. It says, the next verse says, and Peter followed him at a distance. Now I want to ask, um, how do we have any, what is our, uh, how, how close are we to the Lord? Wow. Now, as you consider, um, you know, a lot of times, in our relationship with the Lord, there's distance. Uh, we may follow him, but we may do so at a distance. <clears throat> it may be that, uh, Lord, yes, I love you. I'm following you, but uh, I have some other things that, all, that I also consider important. And so, yes, I'm following you, but I'm not, it's not 100%. And uh, I think a lot of us, we may be able to identify with this kind of experience. Peter was no different. 
he's following the Lord, but he's already compromised. And uh, we'll see a little bit more along that, but it's something to just consider. Do we have any distance in our relationship with the Lord as we, as we, uh, and, and it's something to open to the Lord about, Lord, I don't want there to be any distance between you and I. Lord, if there's anything that is separating you and I, Lord, expose it, shine on it, deal with it so that there's no distance. I can follow you, one with you, 100%. Okay, uh, let's go on to, um, so Peter is following him, and then verse 59, okay? Uh, Gerard, can you read that? Verse 59. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll just read through um, until uh, we'll read through for a little while. Okay. Okay. He'll stop me. I'll stop you. Now the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were seeking false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. And they did not find it, though many false witnesses came forward. But later two came and said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and fill it up in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is, what, what is it that these testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. Okay, so and remember the, what we talked about? So they're saying all these things, right? And Jesus, mm. he remains silent. So a lot of times we don't have it in us to remain silent. We immediately have a response. But we need to learn of the Lord. And I don't mean we need to imitate him. What I mean is because he is this way, because he was actually this way in his humanity in this situation, we can actually be be one with him in these kinds of situations that we find ourselves in. We can actually be a person who doesn't vindicate himself. Uh, we know it's possible, okay? Because the Lord was such a way in his humanity. Okay. And Jesus loved his family just like Nathaniel loves his. Amen. So my daughter's looking for her pacifier. I think she'll find it. Okay. That is very human, Nathaniel. Yeah, very human. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So uh, where were we? The Sanhedrin. Okay. Um, so they were seeking false testimony, and I think we were at verse sixty, uh, verse sixty-three. And now let's finish verse sixty-three. Okay. But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, "I charge you to swear by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God." Okay. Um, yes. And okay. then yeah, and then go ahead. Jesus said to him, you have said rightly. Nevertheless, I say to you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Wow. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. listen to this. Um, so, okay, he charges him to swear. He, I charge you to swear by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so at that point, Jesus says, yes. Okay. And then he says, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is actually a reference to Daniel. Okay. In Daniel uh, chapter seven, verse 13, Daniel, he saw, he says, I watched in the night visions and there with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. 
and he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Now, of course, the Lord is speaking to the chief priests and the scribes. They know, they know when he makes that reference, what he is actually saying. And so uh, at this point in time, uh, and I'll okay, get just one other quick thing. You know, he says, if you are the Christ, the son of God, the Lord responds by saying, I am the son of man. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the same way that he responded to the devil. The devil would always come to him and say, you know, if you're the son of God, do this. And then the Lord would always take the position of a man. So here as well, the Lord, again, is just taking the position of the son of man. Although he's also confirming, I'm also, I am the son of God. So then the high priest has a reaction and you can read that. Um, let's read uh, 65 through 68. Yeah. Then the high priest tore his garments saying, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have? Uh, do we have of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, he is worthy of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who hit you? Okay. So at this point, um, you know, again, he's uh, being punished for being who he is. Uh, and I think, you know, again, we just have to consider ourselves and then consider the Lord. Um, you know, in this kind of environment, uh, I'm not sure how we would react, but, uh, the Lord, uh, he is spat upon and, you know, the spitting is not, a uh, a nice kind of spitting. This is, uh. This is, um, this is rough. You know, there's just gobs of spit being poured upon him. They're beating him and they're slapping him. Uh, and in fact, when he was with Annas, uh, they slapped him there as well. And then they're mocking him. Uh, so this is the beginning of the physical side. Um, it's rough. It's terrible. It's uh, un unrighteous, but it's not anything compared to what is about to come. So while this is happening, Peter is outside in the courtyard and uh, a servant girl comes to him and says, you were with Jesus, the Galilean. And then he denies it. And then another girl sees him. And then she says, oh, this one, he was with Jesus, the Nazarene. And actually in John, it makes the point that one of the people who approaches him was a relative of the person who Peter had cut his ear off. So Peter is in this situation and he's now denying with cursing that he doesn't know this person. And uh, I actually want to take us to uh, Luke. Let's go to Luke 22. Uh, this is particularly striking. And let's go to Luke 22. And um, we'll go to uh, um, verse 60. Okay. And this is the third time that Peter denies. And uh, let's see, Gerard, can you read that for us? Mm hmm. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. And instantly, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowded. Okay. Now, before we read the next verse, you have to realize the Lord, he, he had to have arranged this. He knew this was going to happen. In fact, he told Peter it was going to happen. And uh, so now read the next verse. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he said to him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. 
Uh huh. And keep going. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And then the next and, verse. And the men who were holding him mocked him and beat him. And they blindfolded him and questioned him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who hit you? Okay, so you see the context in which this is happening. Peter, he denies the Lord. Then the Lord looks at him. And I don't know if you all know that hymn, but there's that, that wonderful line, "'Tis the look that melted Peter." Mm. And uh, when the Lord looked at Peter, of course, Peter realized uh, what had happened. But we also need to consider it from the Lord's perspective. The Lord knew that this was going to happen as God. But as a man here, as he's passing through, being judged unrighteously, being spit upon, beaten, and mocked, his closest, perhaps his closest disciple is not far away and denying, denying, denying to first a little girl and then another girl and then a guy that he doesn't know the Lord. So when the Lord looked at Peter, we don't know what was in the Lord's eyes, but we know that Peter, he saw that. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And we always, I think, sympathize and identify with Peter. But I'd like for us to just consider how the Lord must have felt as a human being. How he must have felt being denied. At this point now, the Lord is alone. His, you know, Peter is gone. The disciples have left. And now he's being taken. And he'll be taken to Pilate. And as he's taken there to Pilate, now he's been judged by the Jewish Sanhedrin, okay? Now he will be judged by the Roman rulers. And um, I'd like to stay in Luke 23 if we can. And, um, uh, you know, here, again, there's just absolute unrighteousness because with the Jews, he was condemned for saying that he's the son of God. When the Jews come and bring him to Pilate, look at verse 2. Um, let's see, maybe um, Will Williams, um, can you read verse 2 for us? I can. Thanks. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding people to pay taxes to seize him. And saying that he himself is Christ a king. Okay, so you see there, now they're saying, okay, no, 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 yes. On our side, yes, we, he deserves to die because he said he's the son of God. But they're telling Pilate that he's saying he's a king. And so he's guilty of insurrection and should be put to death. And then Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, it is as you say. Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. And then it says they're vehement, saying that he stirs up the people. Because the thing is, at that time, insurrection, rebellion was definitely punishable by crucifixion. And they knew that. And so Pilate, he finds out that Jesus was from Galilee. And so in verse 7, he says, he realized he's of Herod's jurisdiction. So he sends him to Herod. Okay, and then Herod, he sees Jesus, and he's really happy because he wanted to see Jesus for a while, and he was hoping to see a sign done from him. Now, let's look at verse uh, 9. Can you read that for us, Will? Verse 9, 10, and 11. And he questioned him with many words, but he, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priest and the scribes stood by bohemianly accusing him. And Harold, with his soldiers, having despised him and mocked him, threw around him splendid clothing and sent him back to Pilate. Right. So um, it's interesting. He wanted him to do a sign. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you just consider for ourselves, if, the, if, if, uh, if you are capable of doing something and someone asks you to do it, 
how difficult is it to not do it? You know, uh, it's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Oh, happy to, you know, you're really good at fixing cars. Someone asks you, hey, can you fix the car? You say, sure, yeah, no problem. Well, here the Lord, he's been doing signs for the last three and a half years. And he could easily do one for Herod. And Herod, he just wants to see a sign because he heard about it and he thinks this guy's interesting. But he doesn't do a thing. He answers him nothing. And so Herod and his soldiers, they despise him. They mock him. And they put, you know, obviously mocking uh, splendid clothing on him and they send him back to Pilate. And then verse 12 is very interesting. From that point on, Herod and Pilate become friends. So they, uh, they start to get along with before they were enemies. But after this, Herod is really happy that Pilate sent him Jesus. And so then uh, they get along. And so you just see, there's the corruption of the human government. Okay, now uh, Pilate, he calls together the chief priests and the rulers. And uh, he says, I've examined him before you and found no fault in this man regarding the accusations you bring against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore discipline him and release him. But now at the feast, he's obliged to release one prisoner. And the chief priests, they, um, and the, the crowd at that point, they ask that Barabbas be released. And he was actually an insurrectionist. He was actually a rebel. And um, he had been thrown, he'd, and, he, and he was a murderer, and he'd been thrown into prison. And Pilate, he wanted to release Jesus. Okay? All right, now let's go back to Matthew. We'll go back to Matthew 27. Actually, uh, Luke is the only portion that tells us about, about Herod. Okay, now, um, let's go to uh, verse 21. And Will, can you read that for us? Starting with verse 21. Okay. And let's go, In the gov let, sorry, let's just go until verse 25. And the governor answered and said to him, which of the two do you, do you, do you want me to release to you? And he said, Barabbas. And, and he, Pilate said to them, what, what then shall we do to Jesus, if, who is called, who's called Christ? They said to, they all said, let him be crucified. But he said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out the more saying, let him be crucified. And Pilate seeing that, that nothing was Gain, but rather that uproar, uproar was taking place. They took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, "I am innocent of this man's blood." Mm. You see, you see to it yourself. And other people answered and said, "His blood be upon us and our children." Right. So this is the culmination, and at this point, you know, uh, they they actually prefer an insurrectionist and a murderer unrighteously um they prefer him they prefer that uh, barabbas over over the lord who is completely innocent and um you know sometimes we might think it's like well yes he was completely innocent but you know he still had to go to the cross so it kind of had to happen anyway it's it's better not to think that way uh, I think if you want to allow the full impact of this, you have to really uh, understand what was happening here. And uh, this was entirely, entirely unrighteous. And so eventually, Pilate, all he, can, all he does is he just he says, okay, that's it. I'm washing my hands. I'm innocent of this man's blood. And you can see the vehement reaction of the people. He's saying, let his blood be upon us and be upon our children. And we'll see later on what the Lord's response was to this. But now, you know, in terms of 
uh, we haven't really gotten to the physical aspect of things. He's been beaten, he's been mocked, he's been spat upon, blindfolded, uh, slapped, uh, but primarily the toll has been psychological. Now we're going to transition to the physical and we should note this is going to be us uh, as, as just according to what is in the word, it will be graphic. But um, now I'm going to turn it over to Trevor. Thanks, Will. Amen. Thanks, brothers. I got a lot out of that. Um, Lily, are you are you unmuted? Can I unmute you? I am now. Okay, Lily, we never asked you where you're from. Oh, I'm from South Africa. Okay, sweet. Um, I I like all the South Africans on this thing. It, it, it's always a good time. Um, okay, Lily, I, I don't know what your background is, but I, I have a feeling that what we're about to go over, you've never heard before. And you might you might have read these these verses before, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring out a lot of stuff here that um, that that uh, you'd have to look into history and look into what the Romans did to really understand the significance of what we're talking about. And so the first thing is I I want to just set up uh, the this the current state that. Uh, the Lord is in. And we've already seen that he suffered immensely from a psychological perspective, whether he's been betrayed, whether he's been, uh, 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 there's just, there's just an immense amount of things that the brothers have gone over. Um, one of the things that we should point out is that he is exhausted at this point in time, he's been up for more than 24 hours. And now, um, now this is obviously the disciples were already sleeping in the garden. And I'm sure his adrenaline has been keeping him up for a long time. Um, another thing that historians have traced is how much he walked that night. So... Uh, we don't know how much he walked the day before leading up to this, but just just through the night being taken from place to place to place, um, it was it was estimated to be between two and a half to three miles. So now this is 4.5 kilometers of him being taken from place to place. Um, obviously, he was very used to walking, so this might not have been that difficult for him, but the point is, this is all going to play into his exhaustion throughout this process. Um, there's also something that, that uh, Guillaume brought out, which was the sweating of blood. The medical term is hematidrosis, hematidrosis. And this actually causes the, it's a very, very rare condition where someone has to be in such a um, immense stressful state that their, their blood vessels actually burst into their sweat glands. So this is, the, this is what causes this. I've never experienced stress and anxiety like this. And, and very, very few people ever have. But it's an actual medical thing. And it causes the skin to become swollen, weak, and frail. Okay, so that's just, Lily, that's just the lead up uh, that's that's his current state going into this, and we can read this verse. Can can you read verse twenty six for me? Sure. At the very top. Then he released to them Barabbas, but Jesus he scorched and oh, but Jesus he scorched and delivered up to be crucified. Okay, I've I've read this many times, um, and we can we can easily blow over the word scorched. Um, now I really want to, I really want to dive into what that actually is. Um, scourging, which is also, uh, also known as flogging. Um, you have to understand the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere leading up to this, 
uh, and, and, and the Romans need to control the situation. And the way the Romans would control um, different societies when, when in their empire is they, they came up with very horrific ways of carrying out uh, punishment on criminals. And the reason that they did this is so, to put a fear into the rest of the society that they do not want to go through something like this. Okay. The, the reason why that part is significant is the Romans did not invent crucifixion. Uh, crucifixion was actually invented by the Persians. And Alexander the Great introduced it as a practice to Egypt and, to, and, and in Carthage. The Romans appeared, though, to have perfected this thing. And the reason why it was, it was such an effective way of, of torture and control is because it maximized the amount of suffering that a human would go through before death. And so there are, there are times um, in, in history where the Romans would uh, conquer a certain people and um, on the, uh, they would, all the way back to Rome, they would, uh, they would crucify people on the side of the road so that anybody passing by would know what would happen if you go up against the Romans. And so this is, this is a way of, of mental control. So Lily, I don't, I don't know about South African laws, but let's just pretend that, um, let's pretend you and I are living in a country that we don't know about. I don't know. And let's say there's someone who murders someone in the morning. And um, in the afternoon, they're put on trial. And that night, they're put to death. Do you, do you think, Lily, whatever that person, you know, that person murdered someone, do you think other people who are considering murdering someone, do you think they'd be less likely to do it the next day? I think they'll be less likely to do it the next day. Yeah, I think, I think it would put a fear in everybody around. Man, anything I was thinking about doing, pff, you know what, I'm not going to do it anymore. And this is the point. This is the reason why the Romans did this. So the way they started this is by flogging someone. And the reason why flogging and crucifixion went together was the severity of the flogging also meant how long the person would be on the cross. Because the flogging sometimes was even more severe than the actual crucifixion. Actually, a lot of people died from the flogging and they never even made it to the crucifixion. Right. So many people actually went through this and they lasted on the cross for days. The Lord lasted six hours. Okay, Lily, how bad do you think the flogging was for him to only last six hours? It must have it must have been horrible, I guess. It was, it, was, it was pretty horrible. It was pretty horrible. And so we can come across Matthew 27, 26, and we can come across this word scourging, and then we can just move on. And a lot of us have. But the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you what it is. Okay. Um, basically, what's, what, we'll just call it flogging from, from now on, but it's, it's scourging and flogging are the same thing. Um, the, the Jews had a policy that you could not hit a person more than 40 times. And oftentimes they had a doctor there, uh, to observe, to make sure the person wouldn't die. So the, the apostle Paul later on in, in his epistles, he said that, um, you know, it was, it was 49 minus one. So there's 39. And the Romans though, Lily, they had no limit. It's whenever they got tired, it's whenever they got bored, that they would just stop. And so the Romans were the ones that actually carried out the flogging on the Lord. They're the ones that carried out this flogging on Jesus. And so we actually have no idea how many times he was hit. What was he hit with? 
Well, actually, what ends up happening, and I, I won't, like, I wish you guys would read a little bit about Roman soldiers. They were not cool people. And these guys were, were sometimes the worst part of Roman society. In fact, if we can get them out of Rome, let's just put them in a legion, okay? So imagine, imagine two, there's, there's one to two, they called them lictors, and they're Roman soldiers who had been chosen to do this. They were men without a conscience, without remorse. They were numb in their feeling. And their goal was to hit you as hard as they could with all their strength. What they did is they stripped you down naked. Okay. So the Lord was stripped naked and he was tied to a post. And this thing they called the cat of nine tails was a wooden handle that had nine leather straps. And these leather, these leather straps had rocks. They had glass and they had pieces of sharp bone interwoven into the leather. Would you want to be hit with that? No. No, I, I wouldn't either. And he's actually, he's actually tied to something. So his back is fully exposed. It's just raw flesh. And it's actually very tender. It's very weak because of the hematidrosis that he was going through. And so actually what ended up happening was these, these two men, it was probably two, just started to wail on him over and over and over again. And what ended up happening was the bone actually latches, the bone fragments that are, that are in the leather bands, they actually latch into your skin. And when they pull it off, it rips the flesh with it. And so this is a complete and total horror. And the whole purpose of it was to put fear into the people. Do not challenge us or else you will go through the same thing. So the purpose of it was to be as violent as possible. The scene is complete gore. There's blood everywhere. There's rotting. There, there, there's, there's raw flesh that is dangling from the Lord's back. Okay. Did, have you ever heard this before? Not really. No, it's the first time. Okay. So the result of this is quivering flesh, the loss of massive blood, and it's beyond anything we can imagine. And this is actually what Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes, we have been healed. Amen. So the Lord endured this, not because, not because he did anything wrong, but because you have, because I have. And that is the reason why he went through these stripes. And he was, he was, I, I got to be honest with you guys. He was a man's man. Okay. The Lord Jesus was a man's man. I like, I, he's not, he's not some guy that you see in the pictures who, who can be mistaken for a woman. And he's, he's just flowing hair and blue eyes. And he's so beautiful. No, no, no. He was a man's man. He was a carpenter. He worked with his hands he could stand on the side of a mountain, on, on the side of a hill, and project his voice so that 5,000 people could hear it. Think about that. Yeah. Do you, think he was, do you think he was this small little wussy man no. that just started to, that at the, at, you know, in Matthew 4, 5, and 6, it, he's, just, he's just speaking kind of softly and he has a big sound system? No. He's on the side of this mountain and he projected his voice so that all could hear. Right. I can't even project my voice to a hundred people in a room. Jesus was a man's man. And he took this and he didn't, he didn't say anything the whole time. He didn't say anything as a lamb led to slaughter. He did not open his mouth. Okay. Earlier when Peter cuts off the guy's ear, Okay. Earlier, he says, I could call 12 legions of angels down. Lily, do you know how many angels that is? 
And I know, but it must be a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot, Lily. Lily, it's like it it's upwards of seventy-two thousand angels. Yeah. Honestly, I think one of them could could probably come down and, and take out everybody there. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys. I if I'm the Lord and I man, if these guys are spitting on me and they're hitting me. I'm going to get so mad and I'm just going to be like, say hello to my legions. Okay. Which he will in revelation 19, 19, that will finally happen. It's one of my favorite verses. He just finally comes down with everybody and goes beast mode, but we're not there yet. Okay. And honestly, he's just sitting there and he's just taking this. <laughs> then they, then after they, after they do the scourging and in his, his back is completely opened. They take him over. Can you read, can you read, uh, why, don't, why don't you read uh, 27 and 28 and 29? Yeah. Uh, then the gov governor's soldiers took Jesus into the uh, praetorium and gathered about him and the whole court. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe around him and they wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled uh, before him and mocked him saying, rejoice, king of the Jews. Okay. At, at this point, I've got to be honest. I know, I know they're mocking him. But at this point, I think I'm in so much pain. I don't even care. I, I don't even care. I, I, probably aren't, I'm t I probably can't even hear what they're saying. Um, at this point... Um, the Lord, what they actually ended up doing was they wove a, a, a crown of thorns. And, and we're going to get into a lot of the spiritual significance of what happened uh, next week. But that, that crown of thorns actually signified the curse that God put on man in Genesis 3. And they placed that crown of thorns on his head. And these are big, long spikes, okay? And they're, they're, they're weaving these things together. But the thing is, I can't, I can't just put this on the Lord and, and just kind of, what, what do you do? Just kind of like throw it on his head. No, no, no. We have to make sure that it stays. So what happens in verse 30, Lily? Can you read that? And they spat on him and took the reed and bit him on, and bit him on the head. Okay, they took a, they took a staff or a stick of some kind and they began to beat him on the head so that the thorns would pierce into his head and lodge itself into his skull, which is incredibly, incredibly horrible pain. And that crown's not moving. It's not moving. After, after they beat the thorns into his head, it wasn't going anywhere. Okay. So this is, this is all before before the crucifixion. Okay, do we, we got Gerard still there? Yep. Oh, sorry, bro. Yep, there, uh, yep, yeah. sorry. How you doing, bro? Bro, I'm in, I'm in a bit of anguish, but praise the Lord. All right, amen, bro, me too. Um, okay, so now we, now we go on to him carrying the cross. Um, the weight of the cross is about 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. Uh, it was too heavy for someone to carry, even, even in perfect health. And so oftentimes after the scourging, they would just have, if, if you survive it, um, they would make you carry the crossbar, um, just the horizontal piece. And that, that was about 125 pounds or 57 kilos. Um, I, I don't really know what, what that would be like. They, they would just tie it to your shoulder blades. And when they were, when they were going, um, yeah, when they were going, they would always have a Roman soldier in front of them. And they would be carrying a sign of why this person was being judged. 
because that was the thing. They wanted to make an open display. The whole thing was a display. Don't mess with us. I used to work at a store and whenever they had a shoplifter, they would take them in the back of the store and then they would, they would call the police and the police would come and then they would march that person through the store with the police. And the whole point, the whole point the ownership told me was to scare everyone else from trying to shoplift. Okay, that's a, that's a really pitiful example of what we're talking about. Okay, yeah. but, but basically it's the same thing. The Romans wanted to make this a display. And so what they did is they marched, they marched the Lord and most likely, most likely the, the, the sign that they had was this is Jesus, King of the Jews. This is the sign that would eventually go on the cross above him. And again, this is, uh, this actually has some very huge significance that will hit next week. Um, what, what this actually represented. Mm. Okay. Bro, he, even though we've established that he's a man's man, okay, um, he needed help to carry the cross. Why do you think that is? Because he was probably very weak at the time. He was in physical pain. Um, yeah, bro. Yeah, he's, he's how, almost how would you, Yeah, how would you carry a cross in that state? A right. Anything. That right. Bro, he, yeah, bro, he's almost dead. And, and actually, actually what the Romans would do, um, you know, because if, if it's me and I know what's coming next, I'm not going to cooperate at all. Why, why should I carry my cross to somewhere they're going to crucify me? You know, I, I don't know about you. So what the Romans would do is that they would whip you the entire way, all the way to go God, where they, where they would actually end up crucifying you that's how they would get you to move and continue going mm. so they the entire way the, the lord is just being uh mocked by the people people are laughing in horror as they know that he's about to be judged and they're carrying this this sign in front of them. okay do you know do you know um what the word crucifixion actually means is it is it not to put to an end or i don't know it's interesting actually it comes it's based on the latin word uh which we actually get the english word excruciating uh the original word means out from the cross anytime somebody says they're in excruciating pain they're not because they're not being crucified Okay, so I, I, I think we should think twice next time we want to use the word excruciating. Um, so now the Lord, he's made it, he's made it to, um, thanks to, to Simon, that he was, a, he was a North African Jew, um, uh, other side of Africa than you, bro. Um, <laughs> he was a North African Jew. And, and he helped the Lord carry the cross all the way to Golgotha. And at this part, um, I'll just start talking about the nails. Um, the archaeological digs that they've done that have actually produced some of these crucifixion nails, they're typically five to seven inches long and about an inch in square diameter. Okay, I don't know if you realize how big that is. But that is, that is a significant piece of metal. And this metal was actually, it was not placed in the hand here, in the palm, because the weight would rip out. Mm. But they, the Romans, they're smart. Like we said, they perfected this. So they knew that if they placed it in between the two bones in your wrist, it could actually hold your body weight. And so the Greek in the Greek, it doesn't it doesn't uh, hurt the uh, the text at all. I, we know that it says hand. In the Greek, your hand can also be translated as wrist. So they would place this nail in between your wrist. The thing the thing though that we're forgetting 
is that first he has to be laid down on the cross on the ground. And if you don't, if you don't remember, his entire back is completely exposed raw flesh. And he's being placed on this wooden cross. I don't know how bad of a sunburn you've ever had on your back, maybe times that by 5,000, and then somebody touches your back, okay? He is placed on, do you think it was smooth? No. I don't think it was a smooth, I don't think it was smooth at all, man. So they place him on this, and that in itself has to just be incredible pain. And then they stretch out his hands, and they drive this nail through his wrists into the wood. Okay. Now, what ends up happening is there's a gigantic hole in the ground where the main beam is placed. And as they're lifting him up, they, it just slides into place. And it, it was such a jolt of energy when it actually landed that it would immediately dislocate the shoulders of the person. And this is why the Lord said in Psalm twenty-two, fourteen, all of my bones are out of joint. Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll talk about Psalm 22 in a second. Okay. This is, this is the physical aspect of what's going on the cross. What actually, do you know, do you know uh, how the person actually died? Mm. Did any suffocate? They do. It's asphyxiation. And the reason why is because I don't know if you guys want to try this right now, but if you, if you raise your hands kind of like this, okay. And then try to take a deep breath. Okay. It's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And so if you're fully stretched out like this, you have to literally lift up on those two nails that are, that are in your hands. You have to pull up on those nails just to get a breath. And then you immediately go down. Okay, on top of that, they have to drive one through his feet. Because it just wouldn't be right to just let him hang. So they have to move his feet a little bit to the side. Because if you, if you notice, if you, your feet are not flush unless they're at an angle. Okay. So he, he, they have to bend his knees so that his feet are flush on it. And I, this is, I was telling Nathaniel earlier, this is some sovereign arrangement because there's, there's more bones in your foot than any part of your body. And I don't know how, but I believe the word of God. And I know that no bone in his body was broken. And I have no idea how they drove a spike that big through both of his feet and Mm -hmm. it didn't break any bones but the scripture says no bone in his body was broken Mm. and actually doctors have analyzed this and there is a way there is a way for for this to happen for for a nail that size to go through someone's foot and not break any bones so they drove this nail through his foot and um he would, he would push up on that and pull on the other two. And every single time when you, when you put a nail through your wrist, it goes in a claw motion and it's paralyzed like this. But when you, when you twist it, you've got to pull it and twist it every single time you pull up. It's not just, this isn't a pull up bar. Okay. Your wrist is actually twisting as you're pulling and it's rubbing against the nail. Okay, so he did this for three hours. And for three hours, he's judged by man. And we're going to get into this more next week. But for three hours, he's judged by man. And man just sits there and mocks him. They just mock him. Mm. And then at high noon, bro, I don't know about you, but if I just crucified this guy, and I'm sitting there mocking him, and I'm laughing at him, and, and it's high noon, bro. That means mm-hmm. the sun is at its highest point. And all of a sudden, the sky goes black. Bro, have you ever seen a black day 
at high noon. <laughs> Never. Bro, that's that's some that's a crazy sight. That's a crazy sight. And and I don't know, man, if I was one of these guys, I would be freaked out. Sorry. I'd be like, who, who is this guy? <laughs> and so at this point, all of the sins of the world, bro, there is nothing that we will ever we will have no idea what he went through at this point. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll have no idea. But all the sins of the world were placed on him. Yo. And so this is going to be more of the spiritual aspect that we're going to get into next week. What, what's happening during this time. And for the next three hours, he's judged by God. Yeah. So he's on the cross for a total of six hours. And actually, it says in Deuteronomy that anybody who is hung on a tree, they need to be taken down. Okay, before the sun goes down. So they were on a they were on a time crunch. And so this is why in John 19, when they went to go, they went to go break their legs so they couldn't push up anymore to breathe. It speeds up the process. Yeah. But the Lord was already dead. At this point, I'm gonna hand it off to Nathaniel and he's going to talk about a lot of the interaction that happened on the cross with the thieves and stuff like that. You know, as uh, the nail goes into the wrist, uh, it would hit a particular nerve. And so it uh, resulted in a great deal of uh, additional pain. And so any time the person would pull up to breathe, that uh, the pain would just shoot through the whole body. So in addition to everything else that's happening, uh, that happened every time the person would pull up to breathe or in the Lord's case, uh, to speak. Speaking actually uh, was a, uh, involved a great deal of, of effort. And, um, you know, uh, one thing Trevor had mentioned earlier, because he was suffering hematidrosis, his skin was extremely tender. So if you, you just bear that in mind, it was a lot more tender than it would be usually. So he felt the scourging and the flogging a lot more even than uh, someone else would who, hadn't, who wasn't experiencing that. And so as he's pulling up and down, that, all that feeling is, uh, taking, is happening because his... Uh, uh, back is rubbing against uh, against the the rough wood of the of the cross. So it's interesting. Um, one of the things that he says, uh, one of the first things actually, is in Luke twenty three thirty four. He said, and Jesus said, "Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing." Yeah. Um, so this was the Lord. We've gone through everything that he was experiencing, but this was his heart. And, uh, lest you think that this is not possible for a man to experience. Stephen, as he was being stoned in Acts 7, said the same thing. Uh, but we will have never, 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 never have any idea of what the Lord was passing through at this point in time. And to say that, um, I think we all can agree, um, that's not something we can do in ourselves. And so as he was there and as he was on the cross, in Matthew 27, 38 uh, through 44, uh, this is repeated in Mark and Luke as well. But basically he's being mocked and um you know in verse 39 those who were passing by blasphemed him wagging their heads saying you who destroy the temple and build it up in three days save yourself if you are the son of god come down from the cross likewise the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said he saved others himself he cannot save 
He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe on him. He trusts in God. Let him rescue now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also reproached him. And um, as a little footnote, uh, that I, I was very, I very, very much, um, that really touched me in uh, Matthew uh, 27, uh, verse uh, 42. Um, and it just says, if he had saved himself, he could not save us. Um, so now, you know, this is what is kind of transpiring while the Lord is on the cross. And uh, at that time, if we can go to Luke 23, 39 through 43, um, the Lord wasn't done saving people even while he was on the cross. And um, let's see, Will, can you read this for us? Um, 39 through 43. I can. Thanks. And, and one of the criminals who was hang, who, who were hanging there, blaspheming him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him and said, do you, do you not even fear God, since you are in the same judgment? And we just and we justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we did. But this but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said, Jesus, remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thanks, Will. Yeah, so um you know with all the background that we have now, this conversation was not an easy one to have. Uh, you just consider every breath is, uh, involves in a, a really uh, immense amount of pain. Yet, uh, during this time, while the Lord was being mocked by one of the thieves, he took the time to confirm to the other thief that he would be with him in paradise. And now I'd like to go to John 19, 25 through 27. And maybe, uh, Lily, you could read this for us, if that's okay. Um, I find this particular portion very touching. Okay, yeah, 25 through 27. Okay. And, and they were standing by the cross of Jesus, of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary, the Magdalene mother and the disciples whom he or the disciple whom he loved standing by said said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour the disciple took her into his own home you, know, you just consider <clears throat> mary had given birth to him and had raised him and uh, had been through so many things with him. And, uh, you know, as the Lord is coming to the end of uh, his uh, human life here, um, he takes the time to take care of his mother, to take care of the woman who uh, <clears throat> was the vehicle for uh, him uh, being able uh, to enter into the world. And uh, he, take, he ensures that before, um, that before he goes, uh, she will be taken care of by John, um, the disciple whom, whom the Lord loved. And... Um, yeah, Trevor just pointed this out to me, but when um, Simeon was uh, blessing Mary in Luke chapter 2, he said in Luke 2.35, maybe we can look at that. Um, uh, can we read that, uh, Lily? Just the first part. 35 or 34? Uh, 35. Okay. And a sword will pierce through 
Clear your own soul also. Right. So this is what happened. You know, obviously Mary had had uh, had had brought him forth, and um, she uh, she was experiencing something uh, to watch uh, the Lord on the cross. Anyway, this is a very uh, touching and you might say human scene. You know, we, of course, we know that the Lord is divine and that he's God. But here at this moment, he's there with his mother and she's seeing him. She's seeing him pass through this excruciating pain, psychological and physical. And he, before he goes, he makes the, an arrangement for her to be cared for. <laughs> And uh, uh, at the same time, she's there and she's, she's watching him pass through this. And so um, there's a, a few other interactions, but we're going to save those for next week um, because they apply a little bit more on the spiritual side. So the last one I'm going to talk about is in Luke 23, uh, 46. And this was just as... Uh, towards the end, um, at the end of the sixth hour, uh, and crying with a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And saying this, he expired. So uh, that was, I think that brings us to the end of the Lord's um, the interactions that the Lord was having, the speaking that he had on the cross. And I believe Trevor and Guillaume will have a, some conclusion for us. Amen. Oh, Lord. Amen. Um, well, what the Lord um, had to pass through. Um, I don't know if you remember this account, but in the garden, as he was praying um, to the Father, you know, in Matthew, he talks about doing the Father's will. But in the Gospel of John, in John 17, the Lord is praying for the oneness of the believers. And so on the cross, we just saw he was so human, so tender. Uh, so loving, so caring, even in the midst of unbearable sufferings. And in the garden, in his soul, he was suffering such that he was sweating blood again in Matthew Yet he was praying uh, for the oneness of the believers. He praying for us that we would be one as he is one with the Father. Uh, the Last Supper is establishing the table, which is a wonderful time we have every week to remember him, to declare his death. It's a matter of fellowship. It's a matter of joint participation. It's a matter of being one with one another, uh, one with the Lord, one with the Father. This is the real worship that the Father is seeking after. And so I'm so touched um, by what the brothers have shared uh, all that the Lord had to pass through. Um, there's a little quote uh, that Nathaniel found for us that I will just read it now that you've heard about his uh, physical sufferings. Um, he sent it to us this morning. It's from, uh, I'm not sure I will pronounce this correctly, but it's from Wurst's World Studies. Weist. About the Lord. Weist. Weist. Thank you. Yeah. I knew this would be a problem. Weist word studies. Thank you. Yeah. The Lord was overwhelmed uh, with sorrow, but his first feeling was one of terrified surprise. Long as he had foreseen the passion, when it came clearly into view, its terrors exceeded his anticipations. His human soul received new experience. He learned upon the basis of the things he suffered. And the last lesson of obedience began with a sensation of inconceivable awe, horror. With this there came another 
that of overpowering mental distress. So he was distressed. And so when we read these verses, like the brothers I've shared, we may not be so touched by them. Uh, he was flogged, scorched. Um, he really had to go through a lot. And every time, the whole time, he had us in view. Amen. Willingly, he, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He had this joy set before us. And we are the joy that he was looking at as he was suffering. And so we all here as a result of that, uh, because of the Lord's great love. And when we see what he had to go through because of our sins, because of our lives, because of our thoughts, because of all these negative and evil things, we should not sin so freely thinking that we have the blood we can have forgiveness. We can repent to the Lord. We, we surely can. But we should not take this matter lightly at all. And I think that if we pray, Lord, show me that you're the crucified one. I think our living would be very different. And our appreciation of the Lord's table would be very different, uplifted, enriched. Amen. Um, do we want to read some some verses, Trevor? Yeah, um, I was, you know, I grew up hearing about the cross a lot, but um, I know, I know sometimes, um, sometimes I think we we minimize it too much in the sense that we make it physical, or sorry, spiritual. And we kind of just skip over it. So mm -hmm. it's, um, hey, uh, would you call on the Lord with me and now live by another life? And, you know, uh, I asked a brother once, I was, I was very kind of bothered why we don't, um, a lot of times when we preach the gospel, why don't we say that you're a sinner and you need to be saved? And it was really interesting. His answers, he actually said, yeah, that, that's actually the most effective way to preach the gospel as far as having a dynamic salvation. Um, you can get saved by just calling on the Lord. But actually, when, when we need, um, you know, when you graft two trees, which is, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about this, the grafting, uh, you know, in, in the word. Um, both, both need to be cut and the Lord was cut on the cross, but you admitting you're a sinner is you getting cut. Mm. And if you try to graft a tree without cutting it, it might latch on, but it just won't, it won't be that dynamic. It, it will not be that, that I'm not going to say effective. I, I, the person can get saved. Don't get me wrong. Um, there's actually no verse in the Bible that says that you have to say that you're a sinner to get saved. But at the same time, uh, we do a little bit of an injustice by the way we preach the gospel, that the person doesn't have a, a deep um, salvation experience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the thing is, when I, when I came into the church life, I... I grew up um, hearing about the cross almost every week. And then I was just told to be good. Uh, so obviously, obviously the, the wealth of knowledge that I received after coming into the church life changed drastically. But one thing I never heard growing up is that Psalm 22 was what the Lord was thinking when he was on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I was completely blown away. So I immediately jumped over to Psalm 22, which is what we're going to do now. And I read Psalm 22 and I just started weeping 
because it was an experience that I'd never had before. Um, and we just felt, we didn't really know how to end this or conclude this. So we just kind of decided that we would, we would read parts of Psalm 22. And I don't, I don't know what Jews think when they read this, to be honest with you. I, I, it's so blatantly obvious, but you know, the veil still lies on their heart. And so we can, let's jump to uh, verse 12. We're going to start with, you can read the whole thing on your own. I mean, you can see in verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, this is clearly not, uh, well, if you read this, you'd realize really quick, this is not David. I know David's writing this, but he never had the experience that we're going to read. Um, so can I get, uh, who, who do we got? Who do we got? Uh, I, I'll just go back to Gerard, bro. Can I, can I get you, Gerard, un, unmuted? Sure. Can you read, can you read 12 through 18? Okay. Many bulls surround me. The mighty bulls of Bashan encompass me. They open their mouth at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a shard, and my tongue is stuck to my jaws. You have put me in the dust of death, for dogs surround me. A company of evildoers encloses me. They pierce my hands and feet. I count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments to themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Okay, so when did David, when did David ever go through that? I, yeah, I don't know. Bro. I don't think he ever went through that. He didn't. He didn't. So this, this psalm is, uh, you know, divinely inspired by the Spirit through David. And, and David wrote this down. And, you know, a lot of times we'll read the Gospels and we're reading the outward situation. And we're reading what, what's going on. But what was the Lord thinking? Because he wasn't saying very much. Mm. And you really, you can really touch the depth of the Lord's heart when you read Psalm 22. Um, and so one thing I want to encourage you guys to do is to go read Psalm 22 on your own and, and just turn to the Lord and open to him. I mean, his, his, it says, my, my heart is like wax. It melts within me. So as, as he's going through this physical suffering, his heart inwardly is just melting. And actually, one of the things that the Israelites were supposed to do in Egypt was they were supposed to eat all the, the, what, the head, the legs, and the inward parts of Christ. So there were three parts of the lamb they were supposed to eat, and one of them is the melted heart within him. And so this is something that we need to, we need to experience. And again, I don't, I don't think that we'll treat the Lord and, and we will treat sin as lightly as we do sometimes. I'm totally guilty of this. But if we really see the crucified Christ and we really see what he went through on the cross, I'm not going to be so, so flippant in my, in, my, in my way of doing things. I'm not just going to say, oh, I can just take the blood. It's okay. Mm. I'll just take the blood. It's fine. Because it's not fine. And actually the Lord, the Lord, for that one sin that you did, the Lord went through all of this. And so this gives great meaning to Galatians 2.20, that God loved me and he gave himself up for me. Amen. He went through wow. all of this for me. And so we need to personalize this. Every single time he got hit with one of these, with one of these, uh, uh, cat of nine tails it was to heal me okay that being said let's uh, you know, i want you to read the last two verses of this of this chapter because it's uh, incredible i i love how this ends because it's talking about you gerard i seed will serve him 
that which concerns the Lord will be told to a coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born, that he has done this. Wow. Bro, you're, you're the seed. Amen. You're the seed that will serve him in Amen. the coming generation that he has done this. Amen. Bro, you're going to declare this to the whole world. That Hallelujah. He has done this, bro. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, so this is, I, I've got, the last thing I want to share with you all is I, um, when I was getting into this over the last couple of weeks and I was reading all of this stuff, uh, I know, and, and Nathaniel and stuff, I, um, I, I've, I've been getting into this stuff for a couple of years and one, you know, getting into it again, I just kind of opened to the Lord and I asked him, um, this time, what do you want me to get out of it this time? And it's something that I wanted to share with you all at the end here. Uh, the, the verse that just kept coming up in me, the more I was getting into this is a combination of the end of first Corinthians six nineteen and the, and the rest of verse 20. And it ends like this. You are not your own. You are not your own. And those, those words really, um, really affected me this week that I'm not my own. Do I really understand that I'm not my own? Do I, do I think I'm my own? I think I get to make the decisions. Wow. But if I'm, really, if I'm really living a life totally one with the will of the father, I am not my own. Amen. I don't get right. to make decisions. He does. And then the, the end of the verse says, for you have been bought with a price. You are not your own because you've been bought at a price. And the price is everything that we went over today. And so much of it is stuff that we'll never be able to experience. We'll never know what the Father and the Son went through on the cross. We have no idea. But I know that it was a price. It was a big price. Mm -hmm. So now, as a believer, what am I supposed to do? I need to pick up my cross and follow him because I am not my own. And I need to serve him to the coming generations and declare what he has done. Yeah. So anyway, that is that is our dive session today. I don't know if the guys want to add anything, um, but I'm I'm done.